As a meteorologist and weather presenter, I've noticed more extreme weather during recent years, both in the UK and around the world. From heat waves to wildfires and from flooding to drought, it made me wonder, how are these extreme weather events affecting people around the world? Is global warming responsible? And if so, how can we adapt to a future with more frequent extremes? To answer these questions, I'm going to speak to the scientists who've been at the forefront of forecasting extreme weather, communicating the risks, and developing early warning systems to help protect people against the worst impacts of climate change. And when it comes to extreme weather, few people have more experience than Dr. Mohamed Afzal. Hi, Dr. Afzal, it's Aidan McGiven here. Um, I want to talk about the really busy year that you've had. And it all started back in spring, didn't it, with the early onset of a heat wave? Yeah, this year was very uh, much uh, anomalous and special in terms of uh, weather extremes, climate-related weather extremes. Uh, in, in, the, in the same year, we have uh, experienced drought and flooding. In Pakistan, March is normally considered a spring month. But in 2022, the hot season arrived early and Pakistan experienced its hottest March on record, followed by its hottest April on record. What kinds of temperatures are we talking? How high did the temperature go back in March and April in Pakistan? In March, uh, the temperatures uh, were around, you can say, 35 to 40. While in the April, in the month of April, some of the stations recorded 49 to 50 degrees Celsius, which is um, above, significantly above uh, the normal temperatures uh, in that season. Pakistan's Minister of Climate Change described 2022 as a springless year. And it wasn't just hot, it was unusually dry. Within just two months, a crippling drought was underway. Usually drought is considered as the slow-moving uh, phenomenon. But because of this heat wave, uh, we had developed drought conditions just in one or two months. So um, many international organizations also named it as flash drought. And they said that this is the new phenomenon that uh, because of the heat wave, uh, so quick, uh, I mean, uh, uh, drought has established in the area. A flash drought is defined as an unusually rapid onset drought. And this, as well as the heat wave, had serious impacts on public health, agriculture and the economy. Pakistan has experienced spring heat waves in the past. So how can we be sure this one was worsened by global warming? Climate attribution, a relatively new area of science, aims to answer this question. By using models to compare the climate in a pre-industrial world with the present day, scientists can ascertain how climate change may have influenced the occurrence, frequency and intensity of extreme events. Heat waves have become more intense and more frequent everywhere in the world because of human influence on the climate. So last year we saw this persistent heat wave in parts of India and Pakistan and we estimate that the likelihood of this extreme event has increased by a factor of 100 and going forward by the end of the century we expect that this kind of extreme temperatures will become very common in that region so we expect to see them almost every year and the event will no longer be considered an extreme. From flash droughts to flash floods Pakistan's weather in 2022 lurched from one extreme to the other. From June to up to August and September, mid of September, we have received a monsoon rainfall which is 175% above normal, above the normal of all Pakistan. The rains peaked in August when Pakistan received a deluge amounting to three times its typical rainfall that month. It was wettest in the south where two provinces each received seven and eight times their usual August rainfall. And 3,000 lives were lost and uh, millions of uh, houses were damaged. With more than a third of the country underwater, the Prime Minister of Pakistan described the floods as the worst in the country's history. Are floods like this becoming more common? In our warmer climate, the atmosphere can hold more water vapour and this leads to heavier rainfall this leads to more flooding. And last year we saw this persistent heavy rainfall in Pakistan. And it has been estimated that human influence on the climate 
has made this event about 50% more intense, so these kind of extremes are now becoming more likely to happen. Whilst the risk of flooding from intense rainfall increases in many parts of the world, for some low-lying nations it's the rising oceans that is of most concern. I spoke to Professor Elizabeth Holland, Professor of Ocean and Climate Change at the University of South Pacific. Professor Holland, one of the scariest things in your region must be how much the sea levels are rising. Sea level rise is already beginning to impact us in the South Pacific. In Fiji itself, and remember Fiji is a high island, so we have um, substantial elevation. So we have already relocated three villages, and we've got a number, 30% of our essentially 1,200 villages are on track to need relocation. And that's under the relatively modest sea level rise of a half a meter. And if we're really looking at these high impact, low probability events, these tipping points with the accelerated melting of the West Antarctic ice sheet and the Greenland ice sheet, we're looking at really serious consequences. The world's oceans aren't just rising, they're also warming. In 2022, the temperature of the world's oceans hit a record high. And according to the sixth assessment report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, warmer oceans are likely to result in more intense tropical cyclones. In 2016, severe tropical cyclone Winston caused damage and devastation when it hit Fiji as the most intense tropical cyclone on record in the Southern Hemisphere. Tropical cyclone Winston hit first in Vavao in Tonga and then did a U-turn. Tropical cyclone Winston came back into Fiji waters through the Lao group and between our two big islands. By sunset that day, we had a tropical cyclone plowing into what was then acting as a closed basin. And um, the tropical cyclone piling the water up against one of our islands and creating a tremendous storm surge problem. So I did a mad scramble and then put out a mini forecast on Facebook. And one of my students was able to pick up that forecast and be able to evacuate the school where she was teaching right in the face of tropical cyclone Winston. And so everybody moved to higher ground. And so while there was tremendous damage there in Tailevu, we didn't have loss of lives for that specific situation. The warming seas fuel the more powerful tropical cyclones and we anticipate that in the coming year. As we've seen during recent years, more intense rainfall and more destructive tropical cyclones can result in devastating impacts. But we've also seen serious impacts when the rain doesn't fall. So my name is Geoffrey Sabiti. I work with the IGAD Climate Prediction and Application Center based in Nairobi. Uh, we provide early warning climate services for early action in the region. We have heard a lot about humanitarian crises and food insecurity in East Africa during recent years, partly, I'm guessing, because of increasingly erratic weather patterns. Is this something you've noticed? Has the weather become more extreme during recent years? Events in terms of rainfall have become more of more erratic, followed by flood, followed by another drought. And also, the frequency of these events, for example, has increased in the region. It has increased in a sense that drought used to be a phenomena that occurred in this region. Within a period of maybe seven to ten years, you would have a major drought. Now, since 2010 until now, the region has undergone three to four major widespread droughts. So just to put this into a bit of context, how does the current drought compare with previous droughts? The current drought, the bad part about it, it has taken longer than the previous drought because some areas are facing uh, maybe the fifth uh, failed rainfall season. Around 43,000 excess deaths were caused by the drought in 2022, half of whom were children under five. 
according to a report released in March 2023 by international agencies and the Somalian government. A lot of effort currently is being put in terms of uh, uh, improving or strengthening early warning system where we can be able to uh, provide information for the next season early enough so that it can help uh, government, non-government organizations, civil society and also humanitarian agencies. In the UK, the Met Office issues warnings based on the impacts of severe weather such as rain, wind, fog and snow and the likelihood of those impacts occurring. In 2021, extreme heat was added to the list of weather types that warrant severe weather warnings. And not a moment too soon, just a year later, in July 2022, the first red extreme heat warning was issued, four days before 40 Celsius was recorded in the UK for the first time in history. So was this a fluke occurrence or part of a longer term trend? Seeing 40 degrees in the UK or temperatures above that is something we wouldn't expect in the pre-industrial climate. In today's climate, this kind of extreme temperatures have become possible and going forward by the end of the century we expect that the likelihood of these events will increase and we can see these extreme temperatures every 10 or 20 years. And once Pakistan has recovered from the extraordinary weather of 2022 the lessons they learn will be invaluable for dealing with future events like this. Uh, my name is Dr. Sardar Sarfraz. I'm Chief Meteorologist at Pakistan Meteorological Department uh, based in Karachi. Uh, you're a meteorologist and I I'm just wondering what you would say are the main challenges when it comes to forecasting and warning about extreme weather events such as those that Pakistan experienced in 2022. The spell to spell and uh, short range forecast, short to medium range forecast, it was it was quite good and it was quite I mean uh, fulfilling the uh, the criteria. Unfortunately, the response mechanism is was quite slow in in these cases, so that's why this uh, heavy rains have produced a lot of flooding and uh, people were not ready on on I mean the on public side, on administration side, on disaster managers, managing side. So people were not quite ready for these huge floods. There's no doubt that if people do act on early weather warnings, the worst impacts can be minimised. Early warning systems shape lives, shape properties, you know, minimise loss and damage. That's our experience. My name is Dharam Raj Upreti. I'm the thematic lead, climate and resilience working in practical action in Nepal, based in Kathmandu. I understand Nepal is particularly vulnerable to impacts from climate change. I want to hear about your community-centred approach to adaptation. Understanding risk is really important. So developing of those adaptation plan means um, bringing together 2,000 communities of different areas, different you know, locations, uh, own um, making them aware about climate risk. What is climate change? How climate change affect or could affect their you know, lives, livelihoods and uh, assets. National adaptation programs of action have been established by many countries around the world, but Nepal has gone a step further by adopting a framework for local adaptation plans for action since 2011. This is a bottom-up approach which commits that at least 80% of the funds available for climate change will be channeled to the local level. What we realize is community-centric approach is one of the powerful tools to save lives, to save properties. Disaster risk reduction cannot alone uh, support you know, um, uh, in building resilience. So we, we have introduced uh, risk transfer mechanisms like introduction of insurance, index-based insurance. So whatever the you know the parameters that are coming up on um, hydrometeorological systems, for example, extreme uh, heat wave. What does it mean? Uh, what is the threshold of extreme heat waves? And what is the threshold of extreme cold waves? And what is the threshold of extreme flooding? So based on those threshold. Um, we are trying to build insurance. Professor Holland and her team in the South Pacific have also been working with local communities on practical solutions to help make the islands more resilient to climate change. We have a lot of what they call nature-based solutions going on. 
So in areas we may stabilize the riverbanks and um, install floodgates. And there's some communities here in Fiji and Daku and Buratu. And um, Daku where we've installed floodgates, um, stabilized the riverbanks. And in doing so, we've really made it possible. The, the common area at the center of the village where people gather at least has stopped flooding at every high tide. And so that's really created an impetus for people to move back to those villages. We've got a number of students who have been working on this as well. And it's wonderful to see the first generations of students that I um, help teach to rise to the to the levels of leadership. We've been working in more than 200 communities across the 16 countries, all working together to build resilience and to do the community to community support that is so critical for resilience. The science is clear. Climate change is causing more extreme weather around the world, often with devastating consequences. Even if we avoid the worst projections of global warming by rapidly cutting greenhouse gas emissions in the years to come, we will still need to adapt to a future with higher temperatures, melting ice, heavier rainfall and longer droughts. But for those working at the front line of weather and climate change, learning from previous experiences is crucial for building adaptation plans into the future.